house of the Lord. I've been gone some, and I've missed some of you folks, and actually, I missed you all. <laughs> I don't want people coming up to me afterwards, did you miss me? <laughs> uh, aren't you glad for God's house and God's people? I just am reminded over and over again, as we are going to be looking at how much we need the Lord, but we also need each other. God has put us together for a reason, for a purpose. You're here for a purpose. And the last thing the enemy wants is for you to be here. Amen? Amen. And so as we look at this message this morning, we're going to be looking at um, Mark chapter 14, continuing on in a series. And I really was disappointed that I had to be out of town last week because I really wanted to hear Levi preach. And uh, I'm looking forward to sitting down and, and getting him up on my computer and let him inspire me. Amen? Amen. But today we're going to be looking at faithfulness or fleshliness. Faithfulness or fleshliness. And we're just going to walk through the scripture together. I'm not going to read it ahead of time, but let's bow our heads for a word of prayer before we begin. Our Heavenly Father, we praise your holy name. And Lord, we do just want to worship you. You say you inhabit the praises of your people. And Lord, I just pray now that you would inhabit our presence here and your Holy Spirit would come in honor of your word and that you would empower it and that it would pierce our hearts and stir our hearts and challenge us and encourage us as we endeavor to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I ask that you make your strength perfect in my weakness as I speak as well. And Lord, may just the evidence of who you are be real to us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I've often said, and I'm sure maybe you've said or heard, that people wish they could have just been here on earth with Jesus. You ever wish you could just experience that, even if it were just for a day? To be one of the disciples who walked with him and talked with him, heard him teach, seen the miracles, and just to be in his presence physically. And while that would be a great thing, imagine as a disciple of Jesus Christ and you walked with him, talked with him, seen his miracles, imagine that all your failures would be recorded for all times, for everyone to read. One thing I love about God's Word and the Gospels, you know, a lot of times people say Christians don't live in reality. Read the Word. This is reality. Amen? Amen. They didn't sugarcoat it. They didn't cover it up. They didn't just tell you the good parts. But we have in God's word the, the great victories, but also the great failures as well, so we can learn from them and grow in our walk with Jesus Christ. This passage is not a very pa uh, positive record of the disciples. It's one of betrayal. It's one of weakness, of failure, and of disappointment. The only positive chord through this whole passage that we're going to be looking at today is the resilient faithfulness of Jesus Christ in the midst of excruciating circumstances. I want you to look at the definition of betray. To betray is to be led astray, to deliver an enemy by treachery deliver to an enemy by treachery to fail or desert especially in the time of need to disclose in violation of confidence as we read through this scripture we're going to find that the disciples qualified for every one of these but there's hope so don't stop listening Amen. When Pastor Lynn told me the passage in the series I was going to be preaching, I thought, sure, 
give me the negative one. <laughs> but the more I done the exegesis on it, the more I studied it, the more I prayed over it, the more that came forward to me the challenge and the encouragement there is for us today, even in the midst of the failures and betrayals of the disciples. Jesus had instructed the disciples to go and set up the Passover. They had secured the room. Everything fell into place just as Jesus said it would. And then we come to uh, Mark 14, starting with verse 17, if you want to follow along. This is the Passover. In reality, this is Jesus' last meal before he's executed. And he says, when evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened. And one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. The King James Version says, Surely not I. It's one of the twelve, he replied. One who dips bread in the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Now, I don't know about you, but I think we would all agree no one likes to be betrayed. You're counting on someone, you're trusting someone, you're believing in someone, and they turn their back on you and they betray you. And can you imagine Jesus, one of his very own inner circle, 12, Judas, we know in the scripture, is the one he's speaking of. He had made a deal with the religious leaders for 30 pieces of silver if he would betray Jesus and identify him so that he could be killed. As we read in the scripture in John 12, 6, Judas had a history. Judas Iscariot was a thief, and having charge of the money bag, it says, he used, to help, he, used, he used it to help himself to what was put into it. So they had a collective money bag. He was the treasure. He was in charge of the money, and he stole from it. Why? Because his betrayal was fleshly. He was more concerned about what he could hold in his hands in gold than he was the things of God. Now, I don't think anyone here or any one of us would even consider betraying Christ for a few pieces or coins of gold. Amen? But often we betray him because other things become more important in our lives, and he gets pushed to the side. But then we have the disciples in this passage. In response to Jesus' statement, when he says, one of you will betray me, they all said, not me. I wouldn't do that. And they boasted. And I'll tell you this morning, to be honest with you, I think they were sincere. Amen? I think they meant what they say. I'm, I'm not questioning their sincerity. I don't think the scripture questions their sincerity. The thing is, though, they didn't realize and they were not prepared for what was coming. I think it became more than they expected. And it struck them at the core of who they were. In the next section of the scripture in 27 through 31, we hear self-sufficiency and boasting again. In other words, what they could muster up within themselves. Look at verse 27. Jesus said, you will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. 
But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And I just want to stop there. This is not my main message. But aren't you glad that even in the midst of failure or difficulty or disappointment, Jesus cast hope? Amen? Here he's telling them, you're all going to fall away. But he doesn't leave them hanging there. He goes on to say, but I'm going to go ahead of you into Galilee. I'm going to be out there for you. And Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. There is a doctrine that is woven through our society and our culture in America, probably not just here through the world, but especially in America. We nurture it, we prosper it, we announce it, we uh, ingrain it into the thinking of, the, of every generation. It's a humanistic doctrine that says that I have everything within me to do whatever I want if I just put my mind to it. Amen? Don't we hear that all the time? You can do it. Now, I want you to remind us, these disciples were not wimpy men. They knew hard work. They knew difficult circumstances. They knew how to handle life. They knew how to handle business. But they did not get what they were going, realize what they were about to face. I remember one time as a senior pastor having a board meeting, and God was just really moving in our church, and and uh, we felt like God wanted to move us up to the next level of really being concerned and moving into our community. And I never will forget, and I can picture it to this day, a board meeting, and one of the board members on their own stated that, Pastor, we need to do whatever it takes to do what God wants us to do as a church. And then I seen God put their finger on something in their life, a challenge that they had to step up to, and they stepped away. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against powers of this dark world, and against the, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You notice, Paul starts those words by saying, our strength is in the Lord, not ourselves. We are no match for what we have to face as followers of Jesus Christ. If we make the decision to follow Jesus Christ, it's serious business, and it's not something we can just say, I'm going to do this. We need Christ and the power of His Holy Spirit. And if we find ourselves failing as a Christian, like the disciples did here in this situation, and it seems like it's just failure after failure, we try, we try, and so we try harder, we read our Bible more, we pray harder, and we just keep putting in more effort, but we seem to keep failing, then what that shows us is as we need His Holy Spirit and power, not what we can muster up. We can be a, a religious humanistic, thinking that if we do more, It'll work. When what we need to do is surrender to and allow Him to be real in us and to empower us through His Holy Spirit. Even Jesus, and listen carefully, the Scripture says that Jesus emptied Himself and became a man, became one of us. 
and walked on this earth. He lived the life in the same manner that we have to live it for Jesus Christ here on earth and for God. So even Jesus as a man was totally dependent upon his heavenly father. It was not his own human strength that he was able to do what he did, but his dependence upon the heavenly father to empower him. Jesus in every aspect of his life here on this earth modeled for us how we must live and succeed as a Christian. Listen to what he says in John 5, 18 through 19. He said, Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but he also said that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. And then in John 5.30 he says, By myself I can do nothing. Hear that? Remember, this is Jesus' words about himself. By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. And then lastly, in John 8, I have many things to say and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. They did not understand what he spoke to them of the Father. And then Jesus said to them, When you lift this up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as the Father taught me, I speak these things. In Corinthians, Jesus told Paul in his weakness, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Amen? And then we turn to the next portion where Jesus enters into probably one up to this point, one of the most difficult times of his life. And here we see failure on the part of the disciples. In verse 32 it says, They went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to the disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took Peter and James and John along with them, and began to be deeply distressed and troubled. He said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And he said to them, stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. And he cried out, Abba, which means daddy, like a child calling in distress to their dad. Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to the disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you do not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. And when he came back, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy and they did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, are you sleeping and resting? Enough, the hours come, look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Here Jesus is entering one of his most agonizing moments and difficult times of life. He has one request of James, Peter, and John. Keep watch for one hour. Now I want us to stop here for a moment. Imagine. You're in a place of great danger. You have three of your closest friends with you. So I want you to just picture in your mind for a second, who's three of your closest friends? 
If you're like me, maybe you only have one. Then picture that one. <laughs> but imagine you're going somewhere and you need someone to watch out because someone's coming to kill you. And you've asked your three friends to watch. And when you come back, they were tired, so they decided to sleep. Wouldn't your heart sink? For one hour, your best friends, and they failed you. Why? Because in the midst of even their walk with Jesus Christ, they were still living fleshly. I'm tired. I got to lay down. They were concerned about their own comfort, about their own circumstances, not about the threat of Jesus Christ in his very life. And then we have the final chapter of this section desertion, self preservation, which is the fleshly thing. In verse 43, it says, Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared, the betrayer. With him was a crowd, a crowd armed with swords and clubs. In other words, a mob. Sent from the chief priests and teachers of the law and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard going at once Judas or going, going at once to Jesus Judas said Rabbi and he kissed him can you picture this walking up to Jesus as a friend making an intimate encounter of kissing him on the cheek as they did and were accustomed to in that day And going at once to Jesus, or he said, he kissed him, and then men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew a sword and stuck, struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. And Jesus says, am I leading a rebellion? That you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. And then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. And when they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. It's a shameful thing to be a deserter. They left Jesus totally alone in the hands of his accusers and killers. In his greatest hour of need... They deserted him. Once again, the flesh had failed. Now I could stop there and we could all go home depressed. <laughs> but I'm not going to stop there. As Paul Harvey would have said, for those that are of the older generation who know the name Paul Harvey, there's the rest of the story. You see, this morning, sit here in this congregation, myself included, there are three groups. There are the first group, those who have never decided to even be a follower of Jesus Christ. If you're in that group, I would challenge you before you leave this sanctuary, it's worth following Jesus no matter how hard it gets. Amen? Amen. There's no hope. Hear me carefully. There is no hope outside of Jesus Christ. That's not being exclusive. That's reality. That's the truth. He died on the cross for us. Took the punishment for our sins so that we could be born again and follow him. And have eternal life. But then there are those here today who are attempting to follow Jesus Christ. You want to follow him. You want to live a Christian life. But you're trying or I'm trying to do it in our own strength. Like the disciples did. We may be sincere. 
We may make commitments. I won't forsake you. I won't give in to sin. I won't, I won't. Do you hear the word there? I, I, I. And the sad part is a lot of Christians live defeated lives because they're still trying to do it themselves. Then there's a third group here. Those who have died to self to be raised in Christ and are living in the power of the Holy Spirit and no longer trusting what they can do. And folks, the reality is, and there's times I say, Lord, when I preach or I teach, can I just let up a little bit? I don't think we can afford to let up a little bit. Amen? Amen. The reality is the churches of America had suffered greatly in the loss of their effectiveness and their impact for Christ because too much of what we do is what we can do. Are you with me? Our ability, our expertise, our talents. And I'm not knocking any of those. God gives us those, and we should be using them for his kingdom. But if that's all there is, we are going to fall short of what God wants to do and desires to do in us personally and in us collectively. There seems to be a lack of the supernatural transforming power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and our midst in America. The Apostle Paul gives a vivid word picture or a vivid picture of the contrast of what it looks like to live fleshly and what it lives like, looks like to live faithfully in the power of the Holy Spirit. It amazes me. Every time I look at this, I've studied it thoroughly, and, and it still impacts me when I read it. In Romans chapter 7, I'm not going to read it this morning. I'm just going to relay it to you. I would challenge you to read these two passages. But Paul shows in, in Romans chapter 7, verses 27 through 25, what it looks like to try to live out religion and Christianity in the flesh. And I went back through it again in preparation for this message. And in the NIV, there are 42 self-references in chapter 7, verses 7 through 25. Either I, me, or my. 42 self-references. In this passage, and a lot of you know it well, it's nothing but failure and defeat and a miserable conclusion because he's trying to do it in the flesh. But then you go to the next chapter when he finally decides who will save me from this and he recognizes Jesus Christ, his power, his presence, and his spirit. And you go to Romans 8... 1 through 17, and all of a sudden, all the personal pronouns disappear. They're gone. And there's the victory of living a victorious, effective, powerful life in Jesus Christ that brings him honor and glory because he's walking in the Spirit faithfully and no longer trying to do it in the flesh. Also, if we go to Acts chapter 2, and we're not going to read it this morning again. You go home and read this for yourself. We see a different kind of disciples. Aren't you glad that that wasn't the end of the disciples' story? Aren't you glad that doesn't have to be the end of our story? Amen? Amen. That could be the end of our story. It may be the end of our story if we do not discover what God has for us through His Holy Spirit. But at Pentecost, something happened. And the disciples had an encounter with the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of God 
given to us, as Jesus promised, the helper, the promised helper of the Holy Spirit. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And after Pentecost, they became bold, unafraid, unstoppable, and faithful to the cause and the message of Jesus Christ, even in the face of death, because we know from history books and records that most of the disciples, all the disciples, except one and Judas, of course, died for the cause of Christ. How can you go from denying him three times to dying for him? How can you go from being fearful and afraid of what people might do to you and you stand up bold and preach the gospel to the same people that crucified Jesus? How's that possible? By the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? By dying to self, giving up our fleshly efforts and trusting and obeying the Holy Spirit. The reality of this passage teaches us this. We will either deny ourselves or we will deny Jesus Christ. I'm going to say it again. We will either deny ourselves and follow him or we'll deny Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Discipleship is costly. God wants all of us, amen? Not part of us, not our spare time, not our leftovers. He wants us first and foremost. And out of that relationship, we live our life. But let me say also, fleshliness is a lot more costly. Matthew 16, 24 through 26. Let me share that with you. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life, that's fleshliness. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? It will either be faithfulness by the dependence upon and submission to the Holy Spirit. Or it will be fleshliness where we try to do it in our own strength. And we always are failing, preserving ourselves and sacrificing Christ. But I want to end on this positive note. To remind us who God is. It's not about who we are and what we can do. It's about who He is and what He can do. Amen? We, re we sung the song earlier. God still has great things for this city. He has great things for us. Do you believe that this morning? Do I believe that this morning? Or have I settled for what I can do? The same disciples who in this passage failed so miserably in betrayal and sleeping and all the things they failed to do in the flesh went on to turn the world upside down for Jesus Christ. Amen? Do you realize that those disciples who failed so miserably became such instruments of God through the power of the Holy Spirit and God's power working in them and through them that that's why you and me are here today? Had they continued in the flesh, and I'm just talking about from a, a human perspective, God would have made it happen one way or the other in his divine sovereignty. But had they failed and remained in the flesh, we would not have the impact that they became in the scripture. And Peter, the most boastful, 
and the most devastated. Denying Jesus three times. Denying that he knew him. After Pentecost wrote these words. God's divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Amen. Peter finished well. Why? Because in the midst of his failure, Jesus didn't leave him. Amen. Maybe you're here this morning. Maybe you feel like you have failed and you're disappointed in yourself. I would say to you, don't give up. Jesus is out in front of you. He went ahead to Galilee, amen? And he has victory for us as individuals and as a church body. The thing we have to ask ourselves, first individually and then collectively, is what we're doing in obedience to and following the leadership of the Holy Spirit and by the power of the Holy Spirit? Or is what we're doing what we can do? Heavenly Father, thank you for your love for us. Lord, I praise you that when we fail, you don't stop. You're faithful. Again, there's that word faithfulness. You are the faithful one. The scripture says if we fail, you remain faithful. But Lord, you remain faithful so that we can be faithful. And so God, I pray that you would just take the message of your word and really bring it home to each of our hearts and lives. And Lord, forgive us, forgive me. For all those times where I think if I just pray harder, if I just read my Bible more, not that we shouldn't pray, not that we shouldn't read our Bible, but thinking that it's my effort that matters. When in reality, what we need to do is pray and surrender to you. Read your word so we can know you better and live in your power and your presence. So help us, Lord, to be unstoppable, to be bold to be a mighty force for the kingdom of God in golden. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.